Hi, and welcome to Ethnographic Imagination Basel, a series on reimagining the world from the mundane. My name is George Pomeyu, and this episode is on dance. How dancing not only encompasses the elements of our changing worlds, but also allows us to act upon that world. Today, we are lucky to have uh, two guests on our podcast. Hélène Neveau uh, Kringelbach, um, who did research with dancers and musicians in Senegal, and Leslie Brown, who worked among women concert dancers in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So stay tuned for a conversation on how dance can help us rethink our world. Hélène Neveau Kringelbach is Associate Professor of African Anthropology at University College London. Her research has focused on the lives and works of dancers and musicians, on migration and affective relationships, binational and transnational families in Senegal and France. Hélène is author uh, of Dance Circles, Movement, Morality and Self-Fashioning in Urban Senegal, published in 2013 by Bergen Books. Leslie Brown, uh, our other guest is research associate uh, at the Institute of Social Anthropology in Basel. Her research explores dance, uh, gender, transnational mobility, women's sexuality and trade, primarily in the De Democratic Republic of Congo, but also transnationally. Leslie is author of Kogo's Dancers, Women and Work in Kinshasa, published in 2023 by the University of Wisconsin Press. A heartily welcome to both of you. We are delighted um, that you accepted our invitation and that you're here with us today. Let's start with the question, the simple question of what is dance? It seems an obvious question, a question to which presumably we all have an answer. Um, but I can think of many contexts and many languages in which the word for dance is the same as the word for, let's say, singing or ritual, so that not everywhere the category is so um, obvious. As anthropologists, how do we think about um, dance? Ellen, would you want to start? So in the 60s and 70s, anthropologists were very concerned with defining what dance was for the reasons you outlined because there didn't seem to be a universal definition. In many languages, there isn't a specific word for dance, which doesn't mean that people don't know what it is or don't have a concept of dance. But this was also uh, for reasons linked to the discipline itself, because until then, the study of dance had often been a sort of uh, a side or you know, um, hidden aspect of the study of music. And there was a sense of urgency in delineating our object of study as dance anthropologists. So at that time in the 60s and 70s, there were lots of arguments going back and forth. And someone like Judith An Hanna um, had summarized those arguments in her studies. Um, some anthropologists wanted to expand uh, the focus into human movement, others into performance. There seemed to be a general agreement that it was culturally constructed, it was culturally defined, that it involved some kind of patterned movement um, that varied across cultures, and that very often dance involved some kind of altered state of consciousness. Now, since then, it's appeared much less urgent to define what dance is, because there is uh, flourishing uh, branch within anthropology, the study of dance is much more uh, common and um, uh, uh, much broader than it was at the time. So it seems less urgent to uh, define dance away from studies of music. And I think generally the consensus now is to try to understand rather how people themselves in the context that we study define or understand uh, what it means to dance for them. And we find that uh, it's a universal activity, just like music, of course. So even though many languages do not have a specific word for dance, it, for example, in Wolof in Senegal, there is a word for dance that is fetch, but it only applies to popular dances or to the kind of dances that women do in family ceremonies. It, it's not always used of professional dance, which doesn't mean pe that people don't understand what dance is. 
but there is a tendency to use a term for a particular genre. Uh, like the sabar, for example, refers to a, a dance style, but also a type of instrument, a type of rhythm. And there is a long history that goes with that particular term. And so nowadays, I think many anthropologists would rather, you know, have those conversations in the field with people about what dance means to them. Or even if it can't be talked about, try to understand from practice. So so we have um, kind of broad understanding of movement and what you said very interestingly, a potential altered state of consciousness that participate in that participating Definitely. in that movement. But we also need to leave it open enough to see how these things are constructed um, on the ground uh, by different exactly um, right. actors. Um, uh, Leslie, can you think also of uh, situations in which it's not necessarily obvious what dance is or when the what dance is becomes, historically speaking, um, contested? or Because um, I can imagine there are all kind of hierarchies of dance too. Not all dance is all the time acceptable or respectable. Yeah, and I think... From an anthropological perspective, it's always tricky to start off with a question, you know, what is dance and what is not dance? The contours are really blurry and there's a lot of ambiguity there. For instance, when does, you know, gesture turn into a dance? When does it turn into movement? It's really hard to say. So again, I think this is true. What Ellen brings up is, is ask people themselves um, what it is that they're doing and, but then you know, as anthropologists, we sort of bump up against a whole other set of problems in that it's so hard to articulate something that's so ephemeral and fleeting, and it's really difficult to pin down. Um, and there's a famous um, dancer named Isadora Duncan, and she's, uh, you know, the pioneer of modern contemporary dance. And she said famously uh, with journalists who were asking her what she was doing, and she said, well, if I could talk about it and speak it, then I wouldn't have to dance it. So it is really difficult to to sort of broach that topic with people. But nevertheless, that is sort of the bread of butter, bread and butter of anthropology is is really dwelling in the nuances and the sort of the difficult um, topics to talk about. And and I think you bring up um, something quite interesting about the you know histories. And I think dance is also part of a living archive for a lot of people. Um, and it's an embodied archive. And often when you think of dancing, um, you can think of like moves and genres from the past. And this sort of lives inside of you and you can, you know, bring them up collectively with people and and sort of dance some of these memories together. This is interesting because we also point to the fleetingness of things. It's it's hard to pin it down. It's a fleeting moment. But also I'm thinking here of meaning, how meaning is made. In a song, for example, where you use language, right, an analysis of meaning can revolve around, let's say, metaphors or metonyms, what have you. Here we're talking about an embodied production of meaning or meaningfulness um, and an accumulation of that meaning historically, um, as you say. But if I were to just take a step back, um, I was curious also about each one of your trajectories with dance. How did you come to studying dance in Senegal and in um, the DRC, respectively? And why dance? How you happen upon it? Um, and what, what made you think that this is a interesting starting point? Um, to look at the particular historical, social context, um, and so on. So, <clears throat> as you know, George, many anthropologists um, choose a topic for personal reasons, very often are attracted to a place or to a topic because it's something they um, that's part of their personal history, they feel very strongly about. And then we have a tendency to put a narrative back into this retrospectively and make it look as though we came from a problem in the <laughs> literature, but in actual fact, that's not how it works yeah, most of the yeah. time, right? So for me, it was a lifelong passion. I started dancing as a child. Um, I realized around the age of six and seven that this was something, um, I remember even telling my mom that I wanted to, to dance until I could no longer walk. Um, and by the time I started my anthropological doctoral research, I'd tried lots of different styles, never as a professional, but I'd taken lots of dance classes. I've been to, I'd been to workshops, I'd done ballet, contemporary dance, a lot of jazz, I'd done flamenco, salsa. Um, and I just, um, had a sense that having this 
passion to share with my research participants would be a great way in. I wanted to do fieldwork in Senegal. I wanted to spend time there because this is where my paternal family is from. I had this origin in my family history, but I'd never actually lived there. And I thought, you know, it, it has to be uh, structured around something that I'm passionate about. This is, I suspect, how good work is done. But it's also because dance is ubiquitous in Senegal. I wanted to do fieldwork in Dakar, and as soon as you arrived in, in, in Dakar, in, you know, regardless of how much time you spend there, you will see people dancing. So I was also really in intrigued by this uh, contrast between the fact that dance was ubiquitous and the way in which people spoke about dance, which was often in very derogatory terms. And in fact, my paternal, my paternal family wasn't very happy to see that I'd chosen this as a topic. They found it very difficult to make sense of the fact that since I had this great opportunity to do a PhD in a good university, why on earth would I <laughs> want to do that on dance? And it's, they kept, it, presumably not serious enough or... What, exactly, it wasn't serious enough. And also it's the social context in which people who dance, who perform in public, are assumed to are associated with um, a particular caste or, or group of caste. You know, they're associated with griots or people from artisan caste. My family is from a different background. And in a sense, I was transgressing. I was crossing boundaries I wasn't supposed to cross, unbeknownst to me at the time. Now, just to dwell on this question a little bit more, um, the context in which dances become highly problematic um, because they're um, too uh, sexualized or too erotic, um, perhaps, but also because various publics, uh, national or otherwise, um, might find them um, disturbing or vulgar. Absolutely. And actually, when you look at human history, um, dance has always generated a lot of anxiety and it's often... Uh, caused authorities, religious authorities, or nationalist authorities to want to regulate it and to control it. And I think part of the reason for that is that dance reminds us that bodies can never be completely controlled. There is always a potential for excess. There is always a potential for boundaries to be exploded and for things to go beyond what is considered acceptable in a particular moment. And that's partly due to the ecstatic power of dance and partly due to the fact that dance is fun and therapeutic and a lot of things can happen in a given moment that people can't anticipate and can't control. We can barely control our own bodies and dance reminds us of that, I think. And this is independent of the particular genres of dance or is it particular genres of dance in public that are look down upon or um, in, in such a context? Spot on. So there are particular types that are associated with um, being of, uh, of griot ancestry or a similar uh, associated caste. And it tends and to... Just let's tell our audience very briefly, sorry yes. to interrupt you, um, what the griots yes. are um, for those of, uh, right. who are not <laughs> familiar with it. So in, in some uh, societies in West Africa, there are hereditary categories of uh, prey singers, entertainers, oral historians, people who are there to be uh, the voice of the community. They are said to be the masters of performance and the masters of the word. And their role is to valorize, to speak on behalf of others, to sing and perform on behalf of others to be the community's ritual intermediaries and oral historians. And through their performance, they're meant to vitalize the community, if you will. And they can be rewarded very generously for that. So there are some styles then that are particularly associated with the griots um, that are deemed problematic. So historically, family ceremonies like weddings, baptisms, uh, but also women's gatherings um, are those contexts where although anyone can dance, and particularly women can dance, it's assumed that it's 
griots who are really the masters of the performance in those contexts. They are the musicians, but also um, griot women are assumed to be the ones who are the best dancers. There is an association between this group and performance in those contexts. Now, in more recent times, people who do, for example, contemporary dance or hip hop are often not from these groups. And the fact that the aesthetics of the movement looks different also enables others who are not from griot families to argue that in fact what they are doing is not dance or it's a different kind of dance. So doing different styles enables people to cross those boundaries while maintaining, well, in a way that remains socially acceptable. This gets us back to the whole question of definition and how, in this case, playing with the definition exactly. allows for a certain kind of mobility, social mobility, access to respectability, maintaining respectability. That's exactly. very interesting. Exactly. In some contexts, you can say, well, actually, what I'm doing is not dance. It's more like theater or it's a kind of research. It's work on the self. self. But it's not what the griots do. Right, right. Leslie, how did you come to to dance um, and to dance among women, the dancers in, uh, uh, in the DRC? Well, it goes back to when I was a teenager growing up in Montreal, which is, um, it's a French Canadian city and it's home to a large population of Francophone Africans. And um, early on, I was brought by friends to African run shops that sold DVDs and VHS tapes of dance concerts filmed in Kinshasa and in Brussels and in Paris. Um, and these were spectacles that were filmed on these and, and disseminated all over the world. And so um, we would buy these tapes and then bring them home to watch. And I was just blown away by the spectacle and the, the musicality and of, of course the dancing. And the dancing really was something that elevated the show. And the dancers, for the most part, were, were women, and these were virtuosic performers. Um, and it was absolutely captivating. And, and my friends and I, we would try to master the choreography, learn the steps together to, to perform at parties. Um, and I think this is really what sort of sparked my, my interest initially. And then, of course, much later, I, I began to formally study dance, and especially dance in the DRC, because it has such a rich history. And I was always curious as to why... Um, for the most part, it was sort of a male-dominated milieu, especially in Congolese rumba music. Um, however, women really were present, and they were present as uh, danseuses or dancers. And so this was something that I found was curious, and I wanted to explore more. And so that's how I, I came to this, this subject. And then to... Um to think about, I mean, both your um, books um, and, and research work um, in this context, you both take dance and the performance of dance and then almost moving out in ever-growing concentric circles, you tie it to questions of your work, gender, mobility, um, history, um, how particular genres came to emerge, how notions associated with respectability or disrespect um, uh, comes to be tied, uh, come to be tied to these. Um, Ellen, in your work, you suggest that dance is um, not just about bodily performance as such, um, and you're looking uh, in particular to the genres of sabar, all right, and um, mbalax, is that, am I pronouncing it correct? Mbalax. Mbalax. Um, um, but how these also at once express and shape forms of self-making. Dance is not just dance for its own sake, but it is making those engaging in it um, as selves, as persons, um, and how it shapes mobility, gender, and so on. How does this work? How does this thinking out from dance and then back to dance and into the social world and then back into um, dance, how does this work? How did it work for you? So to look at dance and the different, the ways in which people engage with different uh, genres enables you to look at things that are not normally talked about in society because with dance, as Leslie said, it's a matter of practice. Um, and although people debate the morality of dance, there is a lot that happens in dance events that does not get talked about. So it gives you insight in which um, onto those uh, things that remain normally quite hidden. And one of these things is um, 
is the making of gendered selves. So, for example, in in Senegal, there is um, there is uh, a perhaps much more uh, ritualized um, initiation in for for boys. There is a much more straightforward way in which you become initiated uh, into manhood um, for some groups at least but there isn't an obvious way in which one becomes a woman and it's much a much more gradual process actually even for for men it's much more gendering is a much more gradual process than what it often appears and actually i think the gendering uh, of persons happens very much at dance events this is where you learn to behave in a particular sexualized way or where you can also contest that so this is where you learn how to become a girl and then a woman or where you learn to contest that and the same for boys actually to some extent and can one argue that actually the genera generational sort of selfhood is also made in this case i imagine that from one's parents generation or grandparents generation some of the styles might change um is that is that also playing into this gendered subjection or through not subjection but like self-making through dance yes that's definitely a space in which new generations can show their can can um, make a statement of distinction where young girls can show their creativity where they can show that they are actually ready to become women that they might be um, marriageable for example through their ability to prepare themselves for these dance events through their ability to dance in a way that attracts the attention of the audience, of the musicians. But it's also a way, uh, a space in which different generations can coach each other. Uh, it's a space of female solidarity. Sabar events are very much a space from which many men are excluded and part of the very Suggestive dancing that happens is a part of this is a way of excluding men uh, from those spaces so that women of different generations can, uh, older women can uh, initiate younger women into uh, womanhood, but also a space in which female friends will, for example, help each other uh, with marriage problems. They might help each other with uh, trade activities. It is really, as people say in Senegal, women's business. Yeah. So it, it creates this intergenerational publics among women in which all kinds of possibilities emerge. All kinds of things happen there. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Leslie, your book also takes dance uh, not as something isolated from society and the political economic context in which it plays out, um, especially also historically, uh, but as a central mirror somehow of what's going on in the society more broadly speaking. You look, for example, in how in Congolese uh, rumba, among other genres, women pursue livelihoods. Um, dance can be work um, and is work. Um, visibility, respectability are negotiated in all kinds of ways. Um, how did you come um, to kind of start creating these broader associations and understand dance um, not only through, its, through itself, but through things that happen uh, with it, uh, around it? I think there's a, a politics of invisibility and in visibility. I think that Ellen also was touching on is how do you um, talk about certain subjects, certain subjects that might be really difficult, like changing notions of femininity and womanhood? What does that mean? How do you even begin to talk about that? And I felt that dance was really an entry point to talk about social processes. Um, so it was sort of a way in, for example, um, in Congolese rumba music, or la rumba congolaise, this is a legendary um, music uh, uh, genre that has a long, rich history. And within these bands, there's a sort of a particular hierarchy um, with band leaders, musicians, and singers, and dancers or danseuses at the very bottom, occupying sort of the lowest rung. But despite this, they're really relied upon to attract a paying audience, um, you know, and without the role, without the dancers, there would be no show. 
Um, but paradoxically, um, dancers, despite them being relied upon, you know, for the ambiance and the effervescence that's generated in the concert, they're the least paid band members. And they're also sort of seen as um, uh, morally dubious in society at large. So there was this, this feeling, there was a paradox that I was picking up. While this is a music that's celebrated and really integral and to the, the country's history and identity, um, the role of women and the role that they play um, in this milieu was contested morally. And so this, I felt, was um, really interesting. And I wanted to um, ask people themselves about how, what they thought and danseuses, how they saw themselves uh, within their bands, but also at society at large. I mean, um, thinking back at your book, I'm I'm remembering these moments of, of course, women are in quite vulnerable positions here, um, and and they're very badly paid, as you as you just say. Um, so one one skeptic would come in or say, how is that then work? How do you produce something uh, if you're not paid, if you're put in a vulnerable position, and yet you show that these are forms of, of, of speculating on value, on producing social ties, of uh, transforming in them into something else, something more durable. Um, there is a word for it, right, uh, in the DRC. Um, Débrouillez-vous or débrouillardise. So this is, <clears throat> débrouillardise is sort of loosely translates as the art of making do with one's available resources. And it's how you get by in the city. Um, and uh, of course, danseuses, they come from sort of economically precarious positions. Um, and then they professionalize themselves, which is, so not everybody is a good dancer. You know, it takes artistry and skill that has to be learned. It has to be practiced. Um, and they are professionals within this band, despite the fact that maybe they're not paid in the same way as the musicians are. So this is a work um, that they do, but also the work comes from the sort of effective labor that they do in maintaining social networks, um, you know, with the visibility that they receive from being visible public performers, they also have access to new groups of people. And these groups of people are really important um, for them as they move forward in their careers and later on after they leave um, the, leave their, their career of dance um, that they can leverage for the future. And so this is the work that they do as they are professional dancers um, that is perhaps even invisible, invisible labor that, that they're, they're doing to um, cultivate. It is quite important then, and that's like precisely this analytic focus that you put to think about this as work, um, because it is so easy to to deem it invisible somehow or to not take it seriously as a form of value production. But this also thinks, makes me think of something that's coming up in our conversation, and that's the body. And I'm, I'm thinking here also um, in recent studies of of value production, work, capital in late cap in late in a late capitalist moment, um, the fact that many argue that the body becomes our ultimate capital in a context in which many don't inherit land or houses or or money or what have you, in a context in which employment, um, stable employment at least is scarce, in a context in which, as you said, Leslie, um, a, a speculation becomes uh, both an art and a necessary way to produce ties, value, and so on. The body then becomes one's ultimate capital. I'm thinking also of all these um, uh, studies on uh, young men uh, having nothing else to invest in and then investing in bodybuilding, for example, right? Can we think of the body in movement, in dance, in the particular context that you were are looking at um, in, in, in Senegal and the DRC respectively, um, as somehow also um, aligning with or troubling this idea of the body as our ultimate capital in this historical moment. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, it's very interesting because that is also the way in which people in Senegal often speak about uh, embodied activities. They might say, for example, well, um, if you can't um, do anything else, if you can't be successful through formal education, you can become a dancer, or you can be, become a football player. Um, in a very similar way to what Leslie describes, very often dancers uh, come from underprivileged or perhaps lower middle class background. Um, some of them uh, are school dropouts. And there is a hope and aspiration to 
becoming a success through alternative pathways outside of the formal education system. What I found, though, is that very often this doesn't actually come to pass. First of all, I think this idea of the body as a resource in late capitalism reinforces the body-mind dichotomy. Yeah. It makes, it assumes that the body is disconnected from the mind and that somehow if you can't do something with the mind, then you can do something with the body. That is not actually the case. It turns out that those who ultimately, often those who ultimately are successful in the dance world, often people who are able to articulate what they do. And that's most visible in the contemporary dance world, of course, where to become successful internationally, to work alongside uh, international choreographers, to be invited to perform in Paris or London or at residencies in US universities, you have to be able to speak about your work in eloquent ways. You have to be able to write texts about it. You have to be able to stand in front of an audience and put this retrospective narrative that we also uh, do as academics. Choreographers have to construct a narrative around their creative process. I was inspired by this. Often it doesn't reflect the way in which pieces are created. Pieces are created uh, out of a feeling, a sensation, or an idea, or they're inspired by the work of other groups or an event in the world. But then you need to construct a coherent narrative that will explain to an audience what you are trying to say, how you've come to produce this piece. And people who are skilled in doing that and who are also skilled as performers are much more likely to succeed. And so although many young dancers who are school dropouts, for example, think that at least in dance, they have equal chances and they can do very well, very quickly they find themselves, um, they find that there are, there are hurdles, there are barriers that are very difficult to overcome unless they also have these uh, verbal and intellectual tools which tend to be more available to those who've gone a bit further, uh, those who've, you know, been able to read and who, who've been able to travel, for example. So it's not exactly what people think. Uh, I can I can imagine I mean, it's precisely what you're saying also uh, might apply to less in less is correct because this uh, ability as a dancer to anticipate um, it's almost like an ethnographic ab ability, right? To anticipate, to capture, and to position yourself in relation uh, uh, to these um, possibilities. Right, and that's part of the work that that needs to be done. And all you have is your body. This is the tool, um, um, the tool that's available. And there's this expression, at least in Congo, it's a jeter le corps. So you throw your body into an opportunity. So whenever there's an opportunity, you keep this sort of radical openness to opportunities that might be presented to you. And then you throw your body into it. Um, so, and it's not entirely a self-abandoned, it's a managed, you know, throwing of, uh, but nevertheless, there's this feeling of like you're taking risks with your entire body. Um, and then those risks and those failures of navigating probably these economies of possibility, what have you, um, are also felt on the body. Um, Indeed. Yes. And I, I'm also thinking here of um, now the role of social media. Um, and there's this accelerated pace of, of dance videos that are circulating all over the world of vernacular forms of dance performed by people that would be marginalized, otherwise invisible. And so now the body is becoming digital and is circulating digitally and sort of decontextualized, which is sort of opening up this whole other conversation about dance and, and the digital digitality of it anyway. That's interesting. I, I wanted to also talk with you a bit about the um, way of studying dance. How does an ethnographer study dance? And um, it is a more practical question, I think. How did you research dance? What concretely do you have to do? Um, and we should go back also to what you both of you said earlier, that you came from very personal um, uh, connections with dance and dancing. Um, and how, how did you use that kind of attachment to dance um, um, to study dance? 
um, we we live with this kind of fiction fantasy in the social science sometimes not I don't think everybody but um, that you know you you study it objectively and you study it subjectively we also move past that but it does raise an interesting question about um, how does your own experience and your own skill and um, can how, how can that be brought to the study of performance I think the fact that you've um, I mean for me having engaged having practiced other dance forms than the ones that uh, were practiced in in Senegal um, made me willing to position myself as an apprentice I, I knew the value of being a novice in a practice uh, I knew that um, learning in the field would give me insight into how you actually learn to dance in that particular context and also I was um, like I think many dance anthropologists you have to be willing to make a fool of yourself you have to be willing to be the clown at the back uh, you know people will laugh at but as people correct you and laugh at you you also learn what is important um, I learned that, for example, it um, in many of the regional genres, it's not necessarily the exact choreography, following an exact choreography that matters, but you also need to display the feeling that goes with a particular genre. You need to be able to express yourself. In some contexts, you have to be able to imitate the person who's teaching you without asking too many questions because an apprentice is not supposed to ask questions constantly. You're supposed to absorb a particular way of moving. And the willingness to do that and to fail repeatedly is actually part of the learning process. And concretely, in your case, was that going to dancing classes or was it joining um, groups of dancers, um, having a teacher? So I, I did several things. Um, I took regular classes in West African dances, but also I took part in workshops for professional dancers, which were extremely difficult. Uh, so I was really the clown at the back. But of course, having practice in other genres means that you have this kinesthetic empathy, in a sense, that you're able to absorb steps and movements, perhaps faster than someone who's never danced before um, and that establishes a kind of legitimacy people say okay you can't do this but i can see that you've danced other things before so you're one of us and it gives you a reason for being there for the dance troops uh, the dance groups i followed more regularly and who were working on performances on set choreographies i didn't dance with them i wasn't good enough and they were working on particular shows but I could sometimes join the uh, warming up exercises, for example, and give them some of my own uh, ballet warming up exercises, which they found quite interesting to try. Or I could just be there and take photos and videos. And that also gave me a very good reason for being there and a way of giving something, you know, giving something back to people. And that was, of course, before everyone had smartphones with cameras in them. Now, this this intersection of imitation and imagination or improvisation is, is a very interesting because there's a structure that one imitates, but within that structure, one also creates, right? And that, that sounds that's very interesting. How, how is it for you, uh, Leslie? Well, so since I wanted to explore the milieu and the world of concert dancing and dancers and their position within these bands, um, I... I presented myself to the band leader and the musicians. And I said, I want to come and, and talk to people here. And they said, sure, you're welcome, but you're going to have to become a dancer yourself. And I was like, how do you know if I even can dance? They're like, that's okay. We're going we're gonna to train you. Um, and actually, I mean, this was, this was a way of gaining access, but also building trust and relationships with people that I was um, you know, talking to and, and, and gathering stories from. So it, it was a way of building cultural intimacy, actually, um, which was really crucial. 
Um, because, you know, you can't really do formal interviews. You have to spend a lot of time with people and dance with them and sweat with them. Um, and there's something very powerful in that. And also you make yourself vulnerable as a dancer too, in a lot of ways that they were vulnerable. And, and then that also cultivates like a level of trust. Uh, but just about also mimicking and um, sort of this interplay between improvisation and, and, and you know, mastering choreography. I, um, the choreographer was extremely patient with me, teaching me the different dances that we were going to perform at concerts. And, um, you know, we would learn this through counting, you know, a six count, let's say. On six, you spin. And so in the rehearsal with a live band, you know, I'd be counting the steps. Okay, six, I'm spinning. And I was completely off. I was out of sync with all of the dancers. And it was it was like horrific. And at the end of this rehearsal that was almost a mini concert, the choreographer pulled me aside and said, what are you doing? We've practiced this for so long. And I said, well, six, I don't understand. Spinning on six. And he says, what six? Why count? You have to be totally in sync with the musicians and the drummers. Why aren't you listening to the passage beat? And I mean, this was, I, I was bringing my own set, you know, this is like a Western way of, of, of mastering movement and understanding dance. And really it was, it was driving home this point is that goes all out the door and, you know, from rehearsal to, uh, to the actual practice with um, musicians is you have to be in sync with what they're doing. And that's in a form of embodied knowledge. I'm afraid we're already out of time, but I want to thank you both for this wonderful conversation. Um, and for our audience um, that is interested to learn more about dance in this context, please do check out uh, Ellen's uh, and Leslie's books. Ellen, Leslie, um, I want to thank you very much for your time and insightful conversation. And we look forward uh, to hearing more from you on different, different venues about these topics and others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George.